Ja. Right. So we're now on to the study of perception, sanya. Now the essence of sanya, the basic idea, is actually you can tell the basic idea from the etymology, which by the way is a terrible way of deriving meaning from things, especially with Pali words, but in this case it kind of works quite well because the sun has a meaning, sun is equivalent to the English prefix con uh, in the sense of together. So like, you know, con conspiracy or confederacy or something like that. So sanya, the suffix means to know. So sanya literally means knowing together, right? Or knowing all as one. So sanya is the function of the mind or the property of the mind that takes all of the diverse data of experience and turns it into unified and sensible things. Okay, remember during the meditation we heard before that, that we did earlier that there might be like the sound of a bird, uh, well, but you recognize, oh, actually, it's just sound, and the bird is an idea in your mind. Yeah? So you recognize it. Now, Sanya, of course, is extremely helpful and really essential because otherwise you wouldn't know, like, you've got to know this is a wall. Right? When you see it, you don't see wall, you just see a white color with a bit of shade and so on. But you see wall. And when you see wall, it's not just a sight, but there's also a memory of the idea of a wall in your mind, which has certain properties. For example, ungo throughable. <laughs> okay? So that's kind of mixed up. So you're putting, so that's what Sanya does, is puts all these things together and creates a kind of one thing in your mind which gives you a useful summary. If you think of it, Sanya is a bit like a kind of an executive summary of experience, right? It gives you just enough information that you need to know so that you can get by. Right? So think about how Sanya works, for example, uh, like say if you're living in the forest or something like that. Now, Sanya is incredibly powerful. Now you can imagine that, let's imagine that you are Og the caveman and you're sitting around your campfire at night and in the bushes you hear a sound. Now, if you've ever spent any time in the forest, one of the things that you'll notice happens almost automatically in the forest is that you learn to distinguish sounds incredibly quickly. And it's, it's weird. I remember one time when I was staying in Thailand at a monastery there, I was walking along the path and I heard a very soft sound in the forest. It was a very kind of like a slow, deliberate sound through the leaves in the forest. And I knew this is not a bird, this is not a snake, this is not a reptile, this is not a squirrel. All the things that I thought it might be, I knew that it couldn't be those things. So I thought, what is it? So I just sort of you know, carefully walked over and it was a huge tarantula walking through the undergrowth yeah. and making this very walking very slowly and deliberately right to another monk's hut just over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, it seems extremely venerable, just to let you know you've got a friend on the way. But just that one moment of sound and you can recognize it. So this, of course, has a very great evolutionary benefit, right? So if you're sitting around the fire at night, Og the caveman, you hear the sound in the bushes, and you have to know within a fraction of a second, this is either a deer, in which case you have dinner, or it's a saber-toothed tiger, in which case you are dinner. <laughs> and you've got to know that really, really fast, yeah? You've got to know that really, really fast. And evolution also tunes us in a particular way. Because if the deer gets away, oh, well, you can always have dinner the next night. Right? But if it really is a saber-toothed tiger, <laughs> that's it. Yeah? So it's training us to see these different things, especially to sense out danger and to recognize all of these things. And so it allows us to navigate through the world in a way that's reasonably <coughs> sensible. 
and in a way like Sanya creates like an abstract map of the world like a conceptual conceptual map of the world that helps us to get by in the real world as it is but of course the problem is that that conceptual map that we have of the world isn't always a hundred percent accurate of course it's it's often very accurate but it's not a hundred percent and one of the things like the idea of sanya as the sanya like the sun is the con and ya knowing together so right so it's so it's it, it, it has that same sense both in internal understanding so my own understanding like what a wall is or what something is 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 based partly on my own experience and my own understanding of these things but it also has a very powerful communal aspect to it as well right i mean for a start we've got a word for it and a word is something that's shared so sanya is about we creating these sanya is very closely linked to language creating a, these these concepts these ideas in our minds which we can then share with each other right don't walk through that it's a wall right and so this is how we can share ideas with each other so sanya is what's helping us to do this thing in uh, Australia, oh, I forgot again. I forgot the other night. I always remembered, but uh, I'll do it at the end. In Australia, uh, the indigenous people of Australia use sanya, like consciously using sanya as through their mythology and rituals and storytelling, in order to literally create uh, a living map of the earth. And of the land that they inhabit so that the the songs that you tell and the dances that you do and the rituals that you do will tell you where the river is and where the wallaby goes and what directions the birds are going to be coming from and when the winds are coming from this direction that the fish will be down in that stream and they're telling you all of this information will be encoded into the traditional law which is passed down through the generations. And so the education process is all about learning this. And so when you're learning it, it's very much an embodied kind of knowledge, right? It's a, it's a, it's a knowledge which is embodied like physically in your own body, but also embodied in a culture and also in the environment and in the land around you, in the water, in the, in the, in the streams, in the rocks and the hills, and also in the stars. Right, because the stars is how you get around, so that the, all the stories and everything is it's like a th it's a three dimensional, evolving and changing map of the world that you're living in, which is created through the knowledge that you have. Uh, we did a retreat in Central Australia uh, earlier in the year, and uh, it's an incredible experience, and. Um, uh, some of the guys from the community would take us around and tell us the, you know, the different places and tell us the stories that's associated with it and so on. And so you're sort of getting a sense for the fact, you know, this, this water hole is not just something, it's not just a body of water, but it's part of a living story that makes it possible for everyone around here to live. But it's not a, um, see what we have today, we have a very kind of reductive uh, relationship to knowledge, right? So, so you might like mark on a map like there's this water, water pond, right? And you might, you might even say, you know, you might even have more scientific information. You might say the water is such and such purity or such and such animals live there and these kinds of things, right? But in the indigenous knowledge, it's giving you a much more practical map. For example, it will tell you things like don't stay within 500 meters of this water hole and stay on this side because you don't want your scent to go down there because you'll scare all the animals off. You know, and don't come to the water hole in this time of year, but come in this time of year. And all of that kind of embodied knowledge. Now, when I had had a uh, uh, discussion a year or two ago with an Aboriginal elder in Perth, and we were talking about this and talking about the philosophy, and the first thing that he said, it was very interesting for me, because the first thing that he said when he's talking about his philosophy, he said the core to understand, the key to understanding Indigenous philosophy is change, is impermanence. Is that really? Sounds familiar. 
And that was really interesting because often when we, we think about these things, you know, if we come from outside of that culture, we tend to think of it as like this kind of timeless, eternal kind of knowledge and this culture that's been passed down since time immemorial and these things. But to them, the most important thing is change. The night and the day, the rain and the dry, the cold and the hot. These, the changes of the land and the seasons is what they need to tell in their stories because that waterhole is not always going to be there. Right? Australia, Australia is full of what they call upside down rivers, which is like other people call like sand. <laughs> and, uh, but at some point there's water there and you need to know that. And uh, what they do is, and this is very interesting that they, in the education program, Part, an essential part of the education is that you have to sometimes lie to your children about things that matter, right? So you have, you know, you've got to pass down a kind of knowledge to your kids and things like that. So one time you, you say, okay, there's a water hole off by that hill over there. You know, I want you to go out there, stay for three nights and then come back again. This is part of the training, the test. But there isn't any water hole. And this is like, this is like really serious stuff because you can die like really easily. And they send them off there and then they come back and say, Mom, Dad, you told me there's a water hole. There wasn't any water hole. All right? That's the point. The point is that Sanya perception doesn't, isn't a perfect representation of how the world really is. Because maybe sometimes there's a water hole and sometimes there isn't. And so the lesson is you can't always trust the knowledge that's being passed down to you, but you have to look and see. I, the water hole wasn't there, but did you look where the birds were flying? Did you look what grasses were growing? Did you look what kind of insects were on the ground? Yeah? You need to look and see and understand the signs that the land is telling you now, because what's being passed down to you in the knowledge is not always going to be correct. Yeah? So this is how Sanya works. Sanya, we build up this map of the world that helps us to navigate the world, helps us to learn important things about the world. Is it safe? Is it unsafe? Is it, uh, is it hot? Is it cold? All of these things. But that map is only ever an imperfect representation of the world. And it's imperfect for two fundamental reasons. One being because it's an abstraction and the other reason, or a summary, and the other reason being because it's rooted in memory. It's rooted in the past. Yeah? And the world changes. Yeah? So this is why we often we, we come to rely on sanya and we rely on perception. Uh, <coughs> and we learn in meditation to undo this. to see, come back closer and closer and closer to that raw experience. It's still like a filtering of perception. You know, it's still, it's always there, but it becomes more transparent. You know, you can actually more see how it's working. Now, so we've been talking a bit about the psychology of perception and sanya and how it works. And the individual perception, but also this, the social and communal perception. And then that, that social and communal perception is, um, is created by culture and myth and storytelling and ritual. It's created by waving a flag. Right? And then you create an identity and a sense of self. So you guys can wave an American flag and think we are Americans. I can wave the ochre flag and think I'm a Buddhist monk. And we can often, that kind of, that kind of way of seeing or way of knowing is an essential part of who we are as human beings. But of course it can always be misused as well. It's something we see a lot. As, as Buddhist monks and nuns, is that people don't see us as people, they just see us as a monk or a nun, as some kind of representative of something. Right? 
And then if you don't measure up to their idea of what a monk or a nun should be, then you're bad. Okay, maybe. And so the, the perceptions and the uh, ideas and the concepts that we have around things uh, form another layer, a more subtle layer of what we consider to be ourselves. Can anyone think of any other ways that perception is working or sanya is working to create a sense of self that we get attached to? I'll, just, um, I'll give you one more example. Uh, in cemeteries, because you know, it, one of the ideas is that the self is that which is going to give you some kind of immortal life, right? So in cemeteries, it's, it's kind of weird because they divide the cemetery up according to religion. I don't know if they do that here, but in Australia, in some do they do that here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some. Uh, so you go this like the Catholic section and the Anglican cemeteries section. Are totally separate. Oh, the cemeteries are totally cemeteries separate, are they? Like cemetery, and right. Cemetery. It's not even in the same one usually. Right. So this is perception, right? We formed our group based on our signs, our symbols, our rituals, our myths, our stories, our beliefs, the things that we tell ourselves about who we are and what group we belong to. Right? The story that we tell ourselves about what group we belong to. And I don't just belong to that in the sense of going along on Sunday and sitting in the Mass, or whatever it might be, but I belong to that in the sense that that's who I'm going to live with after I die. <laughs> yeah? And we're going to make it, right? Our group, we're going to the good place, <laughs> right? That other mob, <laughs> bad luck, yeah? yeah? So this is the idea of perception, yeah? And it's weird, isn't it? It's weird how, how you know, how, how this, this works and how this kind of idea like religious identity, political identity, national identity, identity with a football team, whatever it is, yeah, sports is a huge one. So like sports is one where where, where people use this playfully. I mean, most of the time, right? I know, I shouldn't say that, right? This is America, they take sports very seriously here. Uh, maybe it's a bad example. But I mean, in principle anyway, so that's something you take it, you, you, you use it playfully, right? You know, I've got my team, you've got your team, and you know, there's a bit of spirit, and that kind of, it's a kind of harmless way of using it. But of course, when it becomes like sort of nationalism and so on, then, you know, having a patriotism and, pri and pride in your country and so on is fine and that's good, but then when you think, because I have my pride in my country, I'm then going to go to war with another country and kill everybody who is different, then that's not so good. So it can easily be corrupted, right? So it's an essential part of the human mind, right? It's not a bad thing in itself, but it's easily tricked and easily transformed. Yeah? And this is, of course, you know, when people want to use this, you know, this is how you get like propaganda and these kinds of things. Uh, sorry, a question over there. Yeah. Yes, Monte, do you know anything about um, or how this relates? Like, I can't remember the exact percentage, but I recall hearing that um, somehow science has been able to see that, like, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent or something of our perceptions is like mind made. Have you heard that? So, like, I was dealing with, like, I was talking to a, uh, an engineer, a scientist, and mm, I think it had something to do with, like, relative to, um, like, witnesses. And Sorry, relative like, to witnessing what? Witnessing, like, a, a crime or an okay. accident right. or something like that. But anyway, supposedly, um, what we perceive, like, you know, as yeah. we go through life, I just wonder if you've come across that. I've never actually seen the scientific studies or anything like that on it. So, but my understanding is is that, like it's like you said, it happens so quickly, you know, and it's like right. it's, and it's like our mind like filling in the blanks almost. Yeah. And there's like you know like a lot of it is not so much raw. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't know if you can. Thing, in an accident, I might see something else, and if they do somebody else, they have totally different perception of what happened. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the. There's a very famous uh, video clip that was uh, of that of the two teams playing ba uh, basketball or something. Yeah, yeah. You're familiar with that one? Yeah. Everyone familiar? Have you ever seen, heard of that? Or seen it? 
we saw that in, in Sydney, John Kabat-Zinn came and he showed that and the people, it was weird, right? Because I'd heard about it before, so it's just like really obvious. Have you seen it? Have you seen the clip? It's like so obvious. It's basically, there's two teams playing ba basketball, I think, yeah. and they've got to pass the ball. One's got black shirts, one's got white shirts. And the audience is told, you have to count the amount of times that the white shirts pass the ball to each other or something like that, right? Yeah. So everyone, you show that. Now in the middle of the clip, a man in a big gorilla suit comes out in front of the camera and jumps up and down and beats his chest. Right? It's not subtle. <laughs> and, uh, and afterwards, they ask people, like, so how many times did the team pass the ball? And they say, oh, you know, six times or seven times or whatever. And they say, and did you see the man in the gorilla suit? No, we never see the man. And like, no, what? What man in the gorilla suit? <laughs> it, it's just some, it, it really is a, it, it's quite stunning. And when, when, when John Kabat-Zinn did it, he showed it. And, you know, most of the crowd didn't see it. Were you there at that talk? They did Ang Kong brought, brought uh, John Kabat-Zinn out. But, um, Anyway, anyway, most people didn't see it. It was weird. I mean, it's weird for me. I hadn't seen it before, but I'd heard the story. So you're just looking at it. It's just this guy in a gorilla suit walking in front of the camera. And, but what was even weirder was that they showed it a second time and there were yeah, still some people who still can't see it. Yeah. It's it. so weird, right? Anyway, maybe it's got, I don't know if it's got something to do with gorillas or what. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, yeah. But, uh, but, I mean, I don't know if you can put a percentage on it. Yeah. Qu quantifying these things seems a bit... Yeah. No. Anyway, yeah. Um, you had mentioned before that mental images and sounds are Rupa. Right. So for something to be Sanya, it's got to be a bunch of them together. Like, it can't just be a picture of a safety tiger. Right. Right, right, and, and you know, the kandas always come together like it's a structural part of experience. So yeah, it's an important part of, of sanya is, is there, which is pr promoting it, right? So your sanya is your memory of that experience, which is allowing you to do that, so it's participating. But the actual like color of it, like color is rupa. You know, so even if the source of that color might be sanya, it might be a memory of your color you've seen before, but the color itself is rupa. It's a very subtle point. It's a very kind of fine point, but it's, it points to a really sort of fundamental difference in the way that the Buddhist sort of uh, understanding of materiality is, and the, the, the physical world, yeah. it's not it's not a realist world that sort of sits out there. Yeah, it's about yeah. In a lot of meditation instructions that I've heard, uh, you will be encouraged to put aside your ideas of who you are, your identity, like right. American or brother or husband, man or woman. Right. Would those be putting aside some? Right. Yeah. 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 Of course, you can't just do it, right? Well, but at least you, at least you've got an idea. You can do it to some degree. Yeah. You can yeah. set it aside. It's an exercise. Yeah. versus when they're forms because this this idea of, of mental objects as forms is still like a really slippery concept for me and right I'm just not yeah. quite okay okay well th th think of it in terms of for example think of it in terms of something very um uh very 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 basic very primal like say light right that's actually one of the main contexts that it appears in so when you meditate and uh, then if your mind becomes very clear then you can perceive a light. Yeah? Rupang Sanjanati is what it actually says in the Pali, right? So a rupa, you perceive it. So you sanya this thing. Yeah? Uh, now, if this is, I don't know if this ever happened to you in meditation, but sometimes you can be meditating and you know, might be like in a dark room or something like that. And you can be meditating and your mind gets bright. I mean, I'm not talking about any kind of a, amazing meditation experience or anything, but I'm just talking about your mind just getting bright. And you think, oh, the sun's come out. Or like someone's like opened the window or pulled the curtain or something. Like it really feels like it's an actual light going on in your mind. And that experience of the light is exactly like a, a, a light. 
and it, it's, it's the same perception. So that, 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 that property of light is the rupa. Whether what the physical basis of it and the cause behind it isn't the rupa, it's that property which you perceive which is the rupa. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that does. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, I was thinking this earlier. Does it have anything to do with, because I've never heard that before, <clears throat> like the mind form? Like, so when you have that light in the mind, like the mind, I guess, has to have some form in it to right. have the, you know, to trigger that. Right. Perception, so in a way, is a real form there. I exactly, yeah. This is why they call it rupa jhanas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the first four jhanas are called rupa jhanas. Yeah. Because of qualities. Because they're associated with that quality of like some kind of reflected, subtle material property like light. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we good on perception? So now, have you all learned how to let go of perception? <laughs> Like I think, I think because one of the things about perception, because it's made, right? It's a bit more, it's a bit more cultured. Right? Feeling that you can think about, think about these things in terms of, you can think about these things in terms of a developmental spectrum. Actually, like form is like really primal. So, so you can think of that's just like the universe, right? Rocks and stuff like that is kind of form. Vedana and plants. Vedana is very much like the animal realm, right? Getting pleasure, escaping from pain. Actually, everything's mixed up with everything. I'm not saying this is the only thing, but this is where it's, you can see that it's really uh, prominent. Sanya is human culture. Sanya is where human co is, it com comes to the fore in human culture. It's how people figure out how do you like live together, right? How do you have a village? You have a village because you tell yourself a story that you're one people. Yeah, and you, you consciously start developing this concept which can help you to live together. Sankara ha operates at the realm of kind of rationality and uh, philosophy and these kinds of things. So Sankara, is if, if Sanya is how you have a village, Sankara is how you have a city, right? Because you have a legislature, <coughs> legislature and you actually sit down and make a bunch of rules. This is how we're going to live together and this is what we're going to do. Sankara, in terms of the development of a, of a person, an individual, is what we think of as maturity, right? The ability to make decisions, to make choices, you become an adult. Right? Where now sanya, sanya is what kids learn, right? Sesame Street, which one of these is not like the other one? Yeah, you're training yourself in the Sanya, how to use language, how to recognize things, how to navigate your way around the world. You're training yourself in Sanya. And then that's adulthood. You can make your own decisions. You can vote. Yeah, Sankara, you can vote. You can get married. You can go off to war. You can buy a house. This is all Sankara. So we're moving on to Sankara. We'll just talk about this briefly before we break for a tea break. But Sankara, as I mentioned before, is essentially is choices. Oops, that's not been very clearly. Choice. And Sankara is one of the tricky ones to translate. And it's slightly tricky. It's translated in a lot of different ways. And, and we mentioned a, a bit earlier, we discussed the Abhidhamma. <coughs> and one of the problems here is that uh, the concept of Sankara is treated very differently in the Abhidhamma than it is, is in the suttas. Okay? And most of the times, which, not, which doesn't matter, right? That's just a different historical evolution of the way it's explained. But most of the ways that you'll find it explained in modern Buddhism are actually derived from the Abhidhamma understanding rather than from the Sutta understanding. All right? So this is important to make this point clear because you will read different Dhamma books and listen to different Dhamma teachers who explain it in different ways. So you uh, have to understand where people are coming from. In the Suttas, Sankara basically means choices or intentions or decisions, especially morally relevant choices. Okay, now of course it can be broader than that, but that's the core idea that I can make morally responsible choices or irresponsible choices, right? And the, the call to echo that punya visankara, apunya visankara, right? Meritorious, uh, uh, what uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it as meritorious volitional formations. I translate it as good choices. <laughs> 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 And 
So, and the, one of the reasons why you end up with a lot of sort of quite weird translations of the word Sankara, like formations or what are some other ones, concoctions, fabrications, fabrications and all of these kinds of things, which all are all kind of slightly odd renderings because the people are trying to sort of encompass the Abhidhamma and the Sutta understandings of them. But actually in the suttas, it really just means choices and intentions. And it's about that fact. It's about the fact that as we mature and we become adults, we <coughs> identify ourselves with our choices and our decisions. Right? I am the decider. Yeah? That's the identification. That's what Sankara is. I am the one who's, who decides. I'm the boss. I'm the one in charge. That's what Sankara is pointing to. Just FYI, right? what happened in the, in the Buddhist tradition, especially the Abhidhamma tradition, is that like Sankara has another meaning, which essentially is a meaning of all conditioned things. So Sankara has a meaning of basically processes, energies, and things like that. So it can mean all conditioned phenomena. So basically what the Abhidhamma said was, look, anything that doesn't fit into the other ones, we'll kind of bung it into Sankara. So you've got like Rupa is one thing, Vedana is one thing, Sanya is one thing, and Sankara is like, oh, oh, oh these other things. And then Vinyara is this thing. Yeah, so it's a bit kind of ungainly, and unfortunately you miss, you miss that kind of understanding of the progressive nature of, of the aggregates. So anyway, I don't want to get into the history of that and why that happened too much, but just so you can understand where people are coming from when they're explaining it in a different way. So Sankara... I'm the decider, I'm the one who, who says what happens, uh, and I'm the one who's responsible. Okay, so making decisions leads to consequences, yeah? especially moral decisions. So this is the realm that karma op operates in. Yeah? In fact, the word karma is essentially a synonym for sankharas. Right? Basically, the, basically it's the same word. That's correct, yeah, in, in Sanskrit is sanskara, yeah. So then does it go life to life with you? Or? Sans uh, I don't know if you'd say it goes life to life with you, but it's, it's the energy, right? So one of the basic meanings of it is energy. So it's an energy that propels consciousness from life to life. Okay. It's like a force. The root meaning of it is like a force or an energy, yeah. So like what you are today... I'm sorry. Please, go, go, go on. So what you are today... Does have some bearing in what you were maybe in the past to energy. That's right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you might be planning to talk about this tomorrow. Uh, what's your idea of the relationship between Sankara as one of the five khandas and Sankara as part of dependent origination? Well, basically the same. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because my I've heard many teachers say that it's actually two completely different uses of the same word. Mm. That Sankara in the context of the five khandas is very different from Sankara in the context of the Tisha Samapada. Uh, why would that be? We'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's probably, I mean, if we're, if we're going to try to do the whole of dependent origination in one day, <laughs> the chances that we're going to get to discuss anything in any detail is probably somewhat slim. But anyway, look, we'll, talk, we'll talk about it later, but no, I'm not, I, I'm not aware why someone would argue that. Why would someone say that? I want a short answer. <laughs> short answer. Short answer. Um, short answer is because the um, the rest of the khandas appear to arise later on in the sequence. Of oh, dependent origination. So then yeah. Having, yeah. So then having sankara appear right at the beginning doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the sequence of dependent origination. Uh -huh. So um, I've heard so I've heard it explained a lot of different ways. But it's not linear. But always on the idea that. Basically, I've usually heard it explained that Sankara has, in the course of the suttas, it has two different sets of meanings. So one is Sankara in this sense, um, as one of the mental right. khandas, uh, and the other is Sankara in the sense of conditional phenomena. Right. Uh, and then, so then the appearance in Patitra Samuppada is more in the category of conditional phenomena. Uh, no, it's ex it's explicitly defined in dependent origination as punya bi sankara, punya bi sankara, and injana bi sankara. Yeah, we, um, which uh, I have to look it up. Okay. Probably it should be in the Vibhanga Sutra in uh, Sangyuta twenty-four. Yeah. 
12.2. Can't recall exactly what it says there. Anyway, we can look up some references later. Yeah, but it's certainly true that uh, it does have those different meanings, uh, and it's not always easy to sort of pass it out exactly what meaning it has in a particular context. This is tr this is certainly is true. Um, it's also it's also uh, connected with the idea of a ritual, right? Because both the word sankara and the word karma mean also ritual, right? So an act. Right? So we have a, a sangha karma is an act of the sangha of the community. So it, literally the same thing as a legal act. Uh, and so this is where we come together as a group and make some decision that has some consequence. And in the Vedic tradition, a sankara is also a act or a ritual. So you come together and you make a wish, make a sankara that has some kind of consequence. And in fact, the word wish is one of the translations that you could use in certain contexts for sankara. Okay, so I wish for such and such and such in the future or something like that. So sankara has this idea, it's, very, it's, it has, it's the active part of the mind, it's the doer part of the mind. And in terms of uh, human development and cultural development, uh, it's very much what we identify with. It's, it's, all, it's often like the most obvious sort of surface part of the mind that you identify with when you sit down to meditate, right? Because when you meditate, you sit down and your mind's doing all of this stuff, <coughs> right? And you say, oh, what are you doing? And you're thinking about all the things you did do and you're thinking about all the things that you would do in the future. And so this is all happening in the kind of the realm of sankharas. And so we identify with our thoughts, we identify with our choices. And in fact, a very large part of our internal dialogue is how we form our notion of self. So we're familiar with the, 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 the idea of self that we've talked about so far. The Pali word is atta. And the Sanskrit word is Atman. But in the, uh, and in, the, in the Indic traditions, they also use another word for that process, which is very interesting, and this is, this is Ahankara. And we find this both in the uh, Hindu tradition and also the Buddhist tradition, Ahankara. And ahankara, it means eye-making, literally means eye-making. So it's the activity of the mind which is building up and creating a self. Right? And you can see that going on in your mind when you're going through all of these thinking processes, and you can see it very clearly and very annoyingly <coughs> when you sit down to meditate. And how much of all of your thoughts and things is about you defending yourself, building yourself up, justifying yourself, explaining yourself, all of these kinds of things to yourself, and how you so manage to so elegantly win all of the arguments that you have. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so persuasive, right? <laughs> And it's just astonishing that uh, other people don't just fold before the, <laughs> <laughs> the inexorable power of your thinking. <laughs> Curiously enough, everybody else is thinking the same thing. Right? So this is, this is Sankara. Yeah? And so when we sit down to meditate, this is like the number one thing that people get really, they really want to figure out how to do it, right? And one of the statements that I really remember with this it was the statement by a scholar who many of you probably don't know, but a scholar called Max Muller. And Max Muller said it's very hard these days in these fast-paced times with rapid communication and rapid transport to achieve the same kind of peace of mind that the sages in ancient India achieved. Right? You think that's true? Yeah. He was writing in the 1880s. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like keeping up with all that endless stream of telegrams that's coming. <laughs> and those, those horse and buggies, they really go fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> what hope do we have? <laughs> what hope do we have? What can I say? So, yeah. So when we sit down to meditate, and so we have all of these thoughts, and I'm not going to go into this kind of in too much detail, but the number one people problem that people have and the approach that they do it is that they try to stop all of these thoughts. They try to exclude them. They try to keep them out. 
you react because you're reacting with aversion to them, right? This sahankara. But if you have aversion to them, this is just more hatred. And you're having aver these thoughts are all part of yourself. It's actually just you who's doing them. And no matter how bad and how nasty those thoughts are, it's part of who you are. Right? And all of these thoughts just come from greed, hate, and delusion. It's okay, actually. Thoughts are okay. It's not a problem. Greed, hate, and delusion is perfectly natural. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with greed, hate, and delusion. Right? But you understand that as long as you keep doing that, you're going to suffer. That's all. And you're going to make other people suffer as well. That's all. But apart from that, it's just natural. So in, in the meditation, if we think that it's our job to stop thinking, then you're going to have a really hard job. And you're going to be struggling and you're going to get frustrated. But if you realize that this is just part of who I am, maybe I could even love who I am. Maybe even I could just accept that this is part of me. And maybe I could recognize that my job isn't to get rid of that and get rid of part of who I am, but to be at peace with it. And one of the one of those beautiful uh, illustrations of this idea was one when I read many years ago uh, a discussion of an obscure uh, a medieval uh, Indian aesthetic uh, uh, argument in aesthetic philosophy. Okay, so Indian philosophy is, of course, very big because Indians like lots of stuff. Right? <laughs> so lots and lots of books, lots and lots of different philosoph philosophies, and lots of theories about art. Right? Very complicated theories about how different categories of art and things like that. And one of the fundamental concepts in Indian aesthetic philosophy is a concept of rasa. And rasa means a flavor. It's, it's something a bit like, uh, like a genre in, in the way we think about it, but it's a bit kind of more subtle than that, right? So according to Indian aesthetic theory, any work of art must have a primary rasa, right? It's a primary flavor. Otherwise, it just gets too messy. So maybe it's like comedy or maybe it's like tragedy or something like that. And one of the big problems that they had in understanding this theory and applying this theory was the Mahabharata. Because the Mahabharata resists any kind of definition or reduction. It has tragedy in it, it has war in it, it has comedy in it, it has romance in it, it has everything that you could possibly think of. What, what can you say it is? What, what is the rasa of the Mahabharata? And so this was everybody had these different opinions and different theories and so on about what the what the what the rasa of that is. And then to one philosopher, I can't remember his name, came along and said that the the rasa of the Mahabharata is the Shantarasa. The Shantarasa, yeah, the flavor of peace. Yeah? The flavor of peace. And all of the other philosophers said, How can you say this? This is it's full of war. It's full of conflict. It's full of all of these kinds of things. And he said, yes, that's why it has the flavor of peace, because it accepts all of these things without judging them. And all of those things are part of human life, and they all find a place in that. And, and when you accept all of those things, then they pass through you, and then there is peace. I found that such a beautiful explanation. And you think about that inside yourself. Everything that's going on, all of the wars, all of the conflicts, the loves, the, the despairs, the griefs, all of that thing, all just comes from your own greed, hate, and delusion. It's just natural. It's part of being human. So don't try to fight it. Don't try to kick it out. Don't try to judge it. It's who you are. And then it will pass through you. It'll pass through you, not because of anything that you do. It'll pass through you because it's impermanent. Because you can't keep it there even if you tried. And so our problem is that, 
Again, this comes back to Sankara. We think that we're the controller. We think we have to do something about it. But the more we do about it, the more we just make more problems. Yeah. But, but at some point, shouldn't you make some good effort to recognize that these are destructive thoughts, perhaps, or sure. concepts in mind, and do you, something about you it? Re you recognize it. Why do you have to do anything about it? Right, you can, you can do it. So none of these are absolutes. Remember, these, these are just different perspectives, like ways of looking at it. And the reason that I, that I talk about that is because that's very often, because, because I think in our, our society, we're conditioned to be very instrumental about things. Like you see something and your immediate reaction is to be Mr. Fix-It. Like, how do I solve this problem? Right? So sometimes, yes, you do have to get in there and you do have to fix it. Right? But it, so this is why you sort of try to teach that kind of antidote. Yeah. Yeah, so neither of these things are absolutes. It's a part of purifying your mind, you know, a little bit of Right, sure. Yeah. 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 It's funny, it almost sounds like, are you saying, it almost sounds like when you have that discussion, you know, the MN20 or 21 came to mind, you know, the Buddha talks about, like, when you have an opponent. All right. You know, skill for thought. Right. <coughs> but the approach you're talking about always sounds well. Two things come to mind. One thing is I wonder if it's like the one that says the stilling of the, the mental formation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or and or what you're saying is you, you have to do what you're saying first, accept it, recognize it, and then once you've done that, then you can move on to the other. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So sometimes it's more just like a kind of a management thing. Like in certain cases, you know, you recognize, oh, well, look, that's bad. I look, I'll stop thinking about that. You know. But I'm thinking I'm talking at more at a bit more of a subtle level where we, we tend to sort of get quite obsessed and quite caught up in our thoughts, and uh, yeah, this just this feeling that we want to try to control them. Yeah. Anyway, just a reflection. Maybe we should have a bit of a break now. Let's have a break until four o'clock. Does that sound reasonable? You can have a cup of tea.